Hello everyone, good evening and welcome to Biomond Live. Thank you very, very much for joining us this evening. Uh, my name's Rebecca and I'm the Customer Support Manager here at Biomond. Uh, be before I introduce you to the wonderful expert guests who are going to be joining me this evening, uh, there are just a few quick points I'm going to run through with you all uh, just to make sure that the webinar runs as smoothly as possible. So tonight's webinar uh, is um, focused around wound debridement for individuals with diabetes. Um, and it is going to be our podiatry panel this evening. Um, now we're expecting the session to last around about 16 minutes, um, but we are going to be setting aside 10 minutes or so at the end just for any questions you may have. And I can see a lot of you are already saying hello in the chat. So hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, I really hope you enjoy. Um, do let us know who you are and where you're watching from this evening. And if someone could give me a yes and a thumbs up just to say that you can see and hear me clearly as well, that would be amazing. Um, and also, if you do have any questions for our uh, expert guests this evening, um, do please pop those in the Q&A section on Zoom. Uh, that can just be found at the bottom of your screens. So let's have a look at who's going to be speaking for you this evening. So the guests joining me tonight are uh, Duncan Stang, who's the National Diabetes Foot Coordinator for Scotland, and Deborah Wilson, who's a lecturer in podiatry and also a clinical academic at Glasgow Caledonian University and also NHS Lanarkshire as well. So thank you both for joining us this evening. But let's have a little look at what the webinar will entail for you all. So Duncan and Deborah are both going to be presenting. Uh, Duncan's presentation is going to discuss the capability framework for integrated diabetic lower limb care. And Debbie is going to then explain uh, wound debridement in detail. Um, and she'll also be sharing real life clinical case examples uh, from individuals with diabetes. So that's enough from me for now, but I'm going to be handing you over to Duncan Stang, who's going to be presenting first for you this evening. So Duncan, if you're ready, Right. Um, I will just stop sharing my screen for you and then you can pop your presentation on the screen. There we go, I think. Wonderful. There we go. And if you just want to press to view your slideshow, there we are. Perfect. You're away. OK, that's fine. First of all, I'm going to have to apologize to everyone. I have woken up with a rather sore throat this morning, so I am a bit croakier than usual. Um, I have got uh, some honey and lemon here, so um, we, shall, we shall just carry on. But if you don't mind, I will probably be taking a sip every now and again. So as Rebecca said, I am Duncan Stang, Diabetes Foot Coordinator for Scotland. I am no longer patient facing, but I did spend 39 years of my career patient facing and the last 30 of those years um, in treating individuals with diabetes. Um, so, but uh, this evening, uh, I'm going to be talking to you about the capability framework um, for diabetes lower limb care. So developing such a framework had been talked about for many, many years. Um, and there have been many, many editorials on the subject in the early 90s. Um, now, hold on a second, I'll just see if I can take this off the side there, right. <clears throat> there have been many editorials talking about a capability framework, uh, and Diabetes UK set up a task and finish group back in 2008, and FD UK Foot and Diabetes United Kingdom had discussed this at great length, and PD UK, which is the precursor, for FD UK actually set up to look at building a capability framework or a competency framework at that time. Um, but it never came to fruition for many reasons. So under the guidance of the Scottish Diabetes Foot Action Group, which I set up here in Scotland, I brought together, and um, this was after I became, uh, I took up my role um, as a seconded role with the Scottish government as diabetes foot coordinator. So I brought together a group of enthusiastic and committed clinicians and we set up this working group as far back as August 2007 
and we had podiatry service leads. We had uh, myself, we had head of service um, from NHS Glasgow, and we had a consultant diabetologist um, from the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh. So the remit of this group was to develop an integrated competency framework to facilitate workforce development in specialist diabetes foot care. We set out and we were just going to define what the specialist diabetes um, foot clinician would do because we wanted to ensure the highest quality of care possible for individuals with diabetes that would be consistent across Scotland. So, and then we hoped that this would um, prove to be beneficial um, for individuals with diabetes, for service providers, and also for clinicians, excuse me. <clears throat> so what are competencies? These are sets of statements and they identify what people or teams need to know to be able to do or deliver that service that they are um, supposed to be delivering. And they describe the work activities which need to be carried out um, to achieve a particular purpose and outlining the quality standards to which these activities need to be performed. And that was a big, big task and indicating the knowledge and skills people need to carry out these activities. So what is a competency framework? Well, that is a framework that is based on clinical competency sets, but underpinned by theoretical and educational concepts. Though, and we didn't know that there were any specific competency sets for um, clinicians to achieve for diabetes and we set out to achieve this. What we realized was it was pretty fragmented um, around the country and it was dependent on availability within certain areas um, for clinicians uh, to gain extra competence. So we felt uh, benefits for individuals with diabetes. We felt these would assure a high quality care is received and based on need, whatever that individual needed with what they presented, the clinician would have the competencies or capabilities um, to treat that effectively. We had to try and make sure we could establish rapid access to specialist services, because as you know, any delay for somebody with active foot disease um, in seeking or gaining specialist uh, intervention has much poorer outcomes. We wanted to empower um, personal empowerment to self-manage and to encourage um, individuals with diabetes to self-manage where that was appropriate. And we hoped to overall uh, get better prognosis and better health outcomes. So we felt that the benefit for the service would be to develop workforce planning and service development needs so that services could benchmark what they needed to effectively deliver the service that they were delivering and make sure that treatment was in line with national standards and treatment most importantly was evidence-based. And we felt that if um, we could get this right, that would um, help staff retention through job satisfaction and through career progression. So more benefits for podi or benefits for podiatrists. We wanted to identify existing knowledge and skills and identify gaps in knowledge and skills so that there was the opportunity to increase skills in specialist area once they had identified where gaps were. This we also felt would be a very, very useful tool to support performance review and appraisal and increase motivation through structured career pathways so that podiatrists had a clear vision of what they needed to do to achieve their goals and move up essentially the ladder. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that we could achieve advanced roles such as radiology, requesting, prescribing, etc. These are very much a uh, run of the mill now, but when we started uh, mapping this out, these were not um, top of the list. We felt we would get increased clinical autonomy in the US in the NHS setting. 
and lead and participate in research and audit to innovate care and increase leadership um, opportunities. When I said they are in an NHS setting, um, this document is not purely for NHS employees. This document can easily be used by private practitioners as well. And private practitioners are becoming increasingly more important in delivering care for individuals with diabetes. When we talk about skill and capability, etc., I'd like to use this couple of slides, and these were courtesy of Joanne McArdle. Um, now, what you see in this um, picture here is a chap painting a wall. So what's he got? He's got the proper tool for the job. It seems to be getting a good coverage of the wall. Um, he's probably dressed reasonably appropriately. Um, he's masked this area over on the right. So he's doing what he needed to do. He's got the skill to do what he needs to do. He knew what tools were required and he knew what and how to use that tool. And give him another 10, 10 or 15 minutes and he will have completed that task and it, will, and it will look good because he knows what he's doing, he's got the right tools and he knows how to complete the task. And that is a basic job of painting a wall. This chap here is also painting a wall, but he's had a lot more training. He has a lot more skill. His capability levels are a lot higher. You can see he's got a phone there as well, so he's a good communicator. Uh, and he's got the right tools for the job. Uh, and he is working at a much higher level. So these are basically two painters. And this chap here may well have started off with a roller just painting a wall, but he has moved forward through learning and upskilling and working hard to reach this level. And his capability level has risen. He can still paint a wall using the roller, but the chap using the roller can't yet do this till he has undergone the same training and in skill sets knowledge that this chap has here. So when we looked at building this document, we looked at the four development stages we thought would be needed. So stage one was to identify the benefits of introducing the competency framework for individuals and services. And I've covered um, a bit of that. Uh, stage two was actually to develop the competency framework for treatment and management of diabetes foot disease. Stage three was to consult with all the relevant stakeholders, because unless you get the relevant stakeholders involved with a piece of work like this, um, it, it will not be as effective. Um, and then we had to develop an implementation strategy. So that was roughly the four deve developmental stages of the document. We then realized that this was an absolutely major mapping exercise. Uh, competencies individually mapped to existing skills for health and na national occupation standard indicators and to the NHS knowledge and skill framework and sub subsequent KSF levels. Because as I said, we started out by just thinking of looking at what a specialist should be doing. But when we looked at skills for health and dealt with skills for health, it became very apparent that we needed to start from the bottom level and work our way through all the different levels up to consultant level. So rather than just looking at specialist level, we were actually starting at a, a assistant technician level and mapping these competencies the whole way through that system using <clears throat> the skills uh, for health escalator. And then we realized why this had not been done before, because it was a massive, massive mapping exercise. And this is really how it looked at the time, going from support workers right up to consultant um, podiatrists and looking at all the dimensions and the levels of those dimensions within uh, each, um, each um, level throughout this. So that gives you an idea of the task that was ahead of us. So the competency framework, if we look at the pyramid of care, we can see this follows my traffic light system and it goes from low to moderate to high and active foot disease. 
And then we were, we were mapping the competencies that were required to be uh, for the individual to be treating and um, assessing um, individuals in these different risk categories. So we mapped those across from the different risk categories to the, the competency level that would be desirable for that clinician to have to treat those individuals. With my role as foot coordinator, I moved, obviously was moving around the country a lot, and I realized there was many, many uh, exemplary um, areas of care being delivered around the country, but some areas had more of the competency pieces in place than others. And I felt that this document needed to have, we needed to have a way in ensuring all the pieces of, of the service delivery were in the correct place at the correct time. And I looked, or the group and myself looked upon this framework as going to be the glue to do that, cementing together all the pieces of the jigsaw correctly, because we wanted to raise the bar of diabetes foot um, provision across NHS Scotland. So notice that although this started out being a piece of work in NHS Scotland, we have now achieved in Dorson and we're working with Foot and Diabetes UK and the Society of Chiropodists and Podiatrists. So this was the first major document that we produced and it was the Podiatry Competency Framework for Integrated Diabetic Foot Care. Excuse me a second again. <clears throat> so small excerpt from the forward of this document. This framework is an important tool that will facilitate benchmarking of existing skill sets and guidance for professional development of podiatrists who are keen to become specialists and service leaders within the diabetic within diabetic food care. Now, there's a couple of things here. This document was pretty much solely for podiatrists at the time, or it was aimed at podiatrists. Um, and that is something that um, we looked on and have, have developed further, which I will touch on. So forward to 2019, and yet again, note although it started out as a piece of work for Scotland, we have now not only achieved endorsement from FD UK and the Society of Chiropodists and Podiatrists, but also from the from Diabetic Foot International, BAPO, and Primary Care Diabetes Society and Diabetes UK. So this has become a very, very much UK piece of work and a UK document. And it is now the capability framework for integrated diabetic lower limb care. An excerpt from this forward. In the current climate, it is essential that these skill sets are transferable and adaptive to the needs of the whole workforce, not just podiatry. And as such, the framework has been updated by the relevant for, to be relevant for other clinicians in the multidisciplinary foot team, such as clinical support workers, GPs, orthotists, surgeons, tissue viability nurses, etc., etc. In fact, absolutely anyone who comes into contact with the diabetic foot. This document is appropriate for anyone um, who comes into contact with the diabetic foot. And we have also used this opportunity to reflect the current practice and have adopted the terms core skills and capability instead of competency. And that aligns with modern frameworks and skills for health. So moving forward, we decided that the skill levels were probably quite confusing because we didn't want them to be associated with AFC banding levels. So we changed these to letters rather than numbers. And as you see here, it is an A to C and C to E and D to E and E to F. And these are the competency levels that are required to treat the, or recommended to treat the individuals in these different risk groups. <clears throat> and as you see there, here is a list of all of the capability statements. 
from genetic screening and assessment, dermatology, pharmacology, peripheral arterial disease, radiology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the one that I will be talking about just briefly this evening is wound management and really just a small part of that. And just to give you a flavor of how the document looks and how it can work for you. And we'll be picking out in the debridement part of that. So if we look at wound management here, and um, we look at all the different areas that are required. There's the generic debridement, which is really not applicable to a health clear clinician. We, we obviously mentioned infection control load distribution, which refers you to that chapter, and evidence wound, wound care products and devices. But debridement is really not applicable for this or the healthcare assistant practitioner uh, at level B either. But as we move up, you will see what is required. So we're now looking at a qualified clinician. So if we look at debridement, it understands the principles of diabetes and wound bed management to optimize the process of healing. So that is really just understanding the principles carries out wound management techniques within scope of practice. Now, this is very important. Everybody should always be working within their um, own scope of practice and own capability. And for example, antimicrobial treatment, sharp debridement and wound irrigation. An understanding of the requirement to refer onwards for multidisciplinary input as per local, regional, national guidelines. There may be, um, it might need to be, some of these individuals may need to be referred for surgical debridement or techniques that this clinician at this level is, is not up to speed with. So that is an onward referral. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with A, seeking a second opinion or onward referring one of your patients if you feel that that is best for their treatment outcomes. So that is level C, qualified clinician. <clears throat> but as we move up, the specialist clinician is obviously going to be carrying out quite a lot of sharp debridement of simple and complex wounds, but yet again within their scope of practice to make sure that they are practicing safely. Appropriately recognizes the need for advanced debridement and refers the patient accordingly. Someone at this level may have a lot of the capabilities in, in, their, in their toolbox, so to speak, and not may, maybe need to refer, but may need to refer for surgical debridement. <clears throat> An in-depth knowledge of debridement techniques other than sharp debridement, because although as podiatrists, um, that is our go-to sharp debridement, we know there are a lot of very, very effective other forms of debridement out there, of which Debbie will be alluding to later. Um, but, and these can be used in conjunction with sharp debridement, they don't need to be used solely on their own. And sometimes you have a blended uh, method of debridement. Critically analyzes wound care interventions to develop evidence-based individual care plans. So we're talking about developing care plans for these individuals as well, and evidence-based ones at that. And looking at advanced techniques with appropriate support or supervision when that is required. So we're moving up further to the advanced clinician. And yet again, these clinicians will be carrying out um, advanced debridement, the range of debridement tools that they have the skill to use and understand within their, yet again, within the scope of practice, carries out advanced wound management techniques, recognizes the need again for, to refer on for surgical debridement and supports less experienced colleagues in developing advanced debridement skills. So you are now mentoring people with less um, knowledge and skills than yourself at that level. And then we move up to consultant level. So then we're leading an evaluation of novel wound products. We're providing clinical leadership in advanced debridement techniques. We lead in the establishment of working relationships uh, with surgical staff. And that is massively important, especially in the multidisciplinary setting. Um, that we're working with tissue viability, and um, we're working with um, the, our vascular colleagues, et cetera, et cetera, and our orthopedic colleagues, and provide expert opinion on debridement products, techniques, and um, 
indications in local um, and national expert groups. So we have now moved up and we are looking at um, setting out policy and in mentoring and everything at, up at that consultant level. And all these levels have been related in here. And you'll see these boxes down the side. Now this document can be used as a self-assessment tool and you can put in the numbers one to five and there is a key in the document that you can self-assess yourself uh, from levels one to level five and that is the capability um, level key. So, and that will give you a self-assessment score. <clears throat> so we now have a capability framework that um, is multi-professional. It's up to date clinically and terminology wise. It is interactive and it is very, very for, fit for purpose. I have worked in diabetes food care for over 30 years and it is very fit for purpose and is an extremely useful tool. Now, there is this web address here and the document can be accessed at Diabetes on the Net. Um, we'll have a, probably be able to send out that separate link after this so that everybody has that. So really now what you have is a toolkit um, for working in diabetes uh, lower limb care, which is versatile, which is flexible, and it's also readily available as I've, as I've shown you. And it can be used in lots and lots of different ways. And you don't need to be using all the tools in the toolbox. You can be picking certain tools out, using those, getting to know how to use them, learning how to use them, and then moving on to other ones and everything at your own pace. So really focus on outcomes. Um, if you're looking at yourself, you've got to think about how you can benchmark where you are at the moment. And the document is, Excellent for doing that. What capabilities, if you're a service provider, you've got to look at what capabilities are required to build proper resilience across service delivery. Do you have the, the individuals with the right skills, the right capabilities at the right level to be um, treating all the individuals uh, that, which are under your care? And what are the implications um, for uh, of capabilities in line with real, realistic medicine. No matter what level we're working at, we should all be working at the top of that level and striving to be at the top of that level. And this document will guide that. And how can we look at this document helping to address inequalities in the way healthcare um, services are delivered? Because we need to deliver um, uh, our services very differently in different areas and especially areas of deprivation um, and um, services have to be delivered very differently in certain circumstances and this document will help address that. A very good article which I would like to refer you to was written by David Wiley who was the head of podiatry in NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde and Violet Butters in the Diabetic Foot Journal. And the article um, was an impact assessment of podiatry competency framework for integrated diabetes foot care. And it is how they use the framework within their service um, and how they benchmarked their service, how the podiatrist benchmarked where they were and how um, they, how they found the document so useful um, so that they knew where they were and to guide um, career progression and capability progression. And it is a very, very good document for you to read from the Diabetic Foot Journal. So this document was, was the vision of and has been developed by clinicians and it's for clinicians, for all clinicians. It started out as being a podiatry document, but it is now for all clinicians working in diabetes foot care. And its, its plan was to enhance service delivery and the care of individuals with diabetes. And when this document is used properly and it is used for people to benchmark their own skill sets, where it is used 
uh, to make sure that you have the right skills in a workforce to be treating the individuals that you need to do. It works extremely, extremely well. So thank you very much for listening. And I shall now pass you over to Debbie, who is going to talk to you about all the debridement um, techniques that she knows and probably teaches as well. Um, and I will probably now stop sharing my screen, I think. Before you present, Debbie, I just want to say a huge thank you, Duncan, for that fantastic and informative presentation. And well done for soldiering on with your sore throat as well. I think uh, Duncan <laughs> deserves a huge virtual round of applause, everybody. <laughs> but Debbie, if you're ready, uh, we will uh, move on to your presentation now. So if you'd like to share your screen and then whenever you're ready, you can begin. Has actually uh, taken his off the share button. Oh, I do. Of course I can, yeah. And then find the function if you have a look. There we go. So it should say your name on the screen now. Okay. So if I stop screen sharing and you can share your presentation. Okay. Can you guys all see that? Should, that should be coming up now. There we go. Yes, it's on the screen. Thank you, Debbie. Okay, so um Thank you so much for inviting me here today. Uh, I've had such a thrill not only listening to Duncan's presentation, which was fantastic, and I've had the pleasure of working with Duncan pretty much all of my um, professional career. Um, we talk about debridement, and I can honestly say that my debridement skills and going up the competency levels, uh, I can attribute to Duncan's guidance and um, support. So thank you, Duncan. It's very appropriate that we're here today doing this presentation together. Also, thank you to all the international people and people down in England and Scotland who have joined us here. It was such a thrill looking at that chat box. It was great. So um, without further ado, I'd just like to start my presentation. So um, hopefully the learning objectives are that during this pro uh, presentation, we will be able to um, consider the what and why of wound debridement different tissue types, debridement decisions, debridement methods, um, debridement case examples with that, and then have some conclusions from what we go through here. So although, what is wound debridement? Well, although there are many different types of wounds, such as wounds and diabetes, in the presence of vascular disease, such as arterial and venous wounds, neuropathy, rheumatological conditions, etc. Um, there are fundamental aspects of wound management which should be followed to enable every wound to be able to progress through to the healing process. And it has been suggested by Falanga 2000 that the debridement is a vital part of this wound healing process. So according to Vowden and Vowden in 2011, wound debridement is the removal of necrotic, devitalised or foreign material from and around a wound in order to optimise wound healing. So here we have an example of a digital ulceration that has that hard, um, sluffy, dry escarum. Once debrided, you can see we have lovely granulation tissue and revealing, more importantly, we're down to the level of tendon. So being able to clear away that tissue, hopefully it will allow us to have a healthy wound bed to then promote that wound healing process. So, of course, that then answers the question, why we debride wounds? Um, so, in general, the indication for debridement is the removal of devitalised tissue or foreign particles. And, of course, devitalised tissue um, can act as a medium for bacterial growth. Necrotic and foreign material can contribute to this excess inflammatory response in our bodies, resulting in, in some cases, systemic release of cytokines, which can not only delay healing, but also promote a local and a systemic septic response. Um, unfortunately, uh, we have just had a patient in our clinic who has had a devastating, rapid uh, streptococcal infection, um, which was necrotizing fasciitis. And within days of them being referred to us with a gangrenous toe, um, this patient has passed away and he passed away as a result of really aggressive systemic um, sepsis. 
Um, so it doesn't matter how long you've been working in a career, for me, 25 years, it is always shocking when something like that can occur. So understanding the impact that these negative tissue types can have really is fundamental in how we are able to help our patients as quickly as we can away from that risk. But other reasons why we debride is not only to remove bacterial burden from and reduce systemic responses, but it's also, it helps us to determine the depth of a wound and determine structural involvement, just like the picture that I'd shown you previously, where when you saw that toe with the cap on it, you wouldn't necessarily have thought it was as deep to tendon to that flex or digital tendon. Um, we can also debride through established drainage to re reduce callus buildup either around an ulcer or in fact over an ulcer where you can actually see demonstrated by this picture where when you debride that thick rubbery callus you actually can discover ulcerations underneath by debriding that tissue away. Um, and of course ultimately the purpose of debridement is to promote healing. So tissue types are really obviously being able to understand the different tissue types that are present on a wound is fundamental in knowing what you should be debriding away. But typically we don't have wounds that just are all sluffy or all granulating or all necrotic. Typically ulcers will present with a whole variety of different tissues on them. This is a patient that was referred to me um, who had just had surgical debridement urgently with digital amputation as a procedure to save him from going into systemic sepsis. So the surgeons went in and did a surgical procedure to remove the tissue and remove the digit. And then it's referred on to me to then fix, fix the wound from that point. So you're then left with the challenge. How do you do that? And where do you start? Well, one of the places that you start is that by identifying the most dangerous tissue type and trying to promote um, the wound to get to the most positive tissue type is one of the first ways in understanding the process of getting and assisting your patient to that healing point. So non-viable tissue may be yellow, it may be grey, blue, brown or black, and it could be soft or slimy in consistency and form a hard eschar um, over the surface of the wound. It can form, um, it, sorry, devitalized tissue, negative tissue forms of non-viable tissue include that necrotic, gangrenous, sluffy, fibrinous, um, compromised tissue, and it may even contain inert contaminants such as uh, skin debris or even dressing uh, debris or dressing residues. So what I've done with this slide is I've not just copied uh, Duncan's uh, prism uh, uh, diagrams, but I've adapted it to represent the different tissue types, but also the impact that they would have on a uh, positive or negative wound behaviour. Um, so you can see at the bottom of the prism is the most negative tissue type. And as we go up the prism, you're wanting to take it up to the most positive tissue type. And of course, the viable tissues, which are our granulation and our epithelial tissues. Okay, so when you have a wound, you recognise the tissue types, identify them, and what you're trying to do for that wound is get them up prism to healing. So examples of how we um, of, of wounds where we have done that, and I will give more examples of the, the techniques that we have used. But here we have this gentleman who has this really um, multicoloured presence of different tissues in the wound, and what we want to do is move them up that prism to a more positive tissue type. And here we've taken them from the multicolored wound to hopefully what is more a granulating tissue with epithelialized edges, but we still have a bit of presence of tendon. We still have a bit of slough. So there's still work to do here, but we are going up the prism and we are in the right direction for healing. Another example is this gentleman who had, unfortunately, diabetes and peripheral neuropathy and he went to soak his feet and what he didn't realize was he was soaking his feet in a basin of boiling hot water. And you can actually see the tide line to the level in which he had put his foot in the water. So he caused devastating burns to his feet resulting in sluffy uh, necrosis. And of course you can see gangrene of the digit. 
but through good wound care, debridement being one of them, um, and getting rid of the negative tissue types, we were able to take them to epithelialise to a fully healed foot. There are challenges with that healed foot in terms of the condition of the new skin and the structures of the foot. However, in terms of debridement and promoting healing, we did a good job. So let's go into a wee bit more detail of the actual tissue types that we are identifying and looking for. So using this image here, we have epithelial tissue, which as we have said, is a positive tissue type. That's what we want to get. We want our, our wounds to epithelialize, get into that maturation stage where the, the tiles on the roof have formed and the wound is closed, okay? Or it can be where a wound is just about to break down. So you identify a vulnerable area that's just about to break down, okay? But certainly when a wound has healed, the epithelial tissue is positive. Um, when formed, the original wound is no longer open per se. There's still healing going on deep in the dermis um, as a result of the maturation phase, but it is healed over the top. And that's following the growth of the new epithelium and will require protection until the tissues are properly consolidated, um, until all the collagen um, and all the fibroblasts have managed to tighten up and, and get tensile strength and, and reduce the amount of vascular um, uh, blood flow to that area that was involved in that healing process. But at this stage, when it's just healed, recurrence is still very high because that new tissue is still very vulnerable. Other tissue types that we can identify in this wound is granulation tissue, so a positive tissue type. So the presence of granulation tissue is obviously considered to be a very good thing. It's formed in the proliferative phase of healing and granulation tissue is a type of new connective tissue consisting of structures such as hair follicles, sebaceous and sweat glands, nerves, and of course, microscopic blood vessels um, supplying blood to that area. And its main functions from an immune point of view are for protecting the wound surface from microbial invasion and of course further injury. And the other function is its proliferative function, which is that the formulation of the granulation tissue helps to fill the wound from the base um, as a result of this new vasculature that is being sent to that area. So hand, uh, granulation tissue is rich and it's red in appearance and very easily identified. Here we have sluffy tissue in the wound, and it can be identified as being that cream, yellow, tan, depending on the level of hydration. The drier the slough is, the darker it becomes. You can sometimes look as though it's a bit gangrenous, but when um, hydration is donated to it, you will see that sluffy tissue. And it may even be slimy or, or gelatinous, um, stringy or even fibrous in its uh, consistency. Um, but it mainly is formed of dead cellular debris, including protein, fibrin, leukocytes, um, hence that yellow creamy colour, and of course, bacterial cells uh, can be found in there. In this picture, you can also see that we have got presence of tendon where the, the second and third toes have been amputated surgically. You can see that there still is some digital extensor tendon present in the wound. And it's important to identify that as a structure. So a tendon is a fibrous connective tissue which attaches muscle to bone and it serves to move that bone or that structure. And once visible in a wound, it indicates significant depth. So it's really important to know, are you down to bone? Are you down to tendon? Um, in order to understand the severity of risk to that limb and potentially how that may influence any antimicrobial management that you may have. Um, tendons are like, uh, if you look at them under a, a microscope, tendons are like the, the, the strings of a violin bow. So if you actually look at it from a distance, it looks like one solid piece. But when you look at it close up, it's actually made up of hundreds of thousands of long fibers. Now, Staphylococcus aureus as a bacteria is spherical. And when you look at that under an electron microscope, as it sits on a tendon, that staphylococcal bacteria has the ability when it proliferates in virulent, aggressive, infection-forming states, can indeed travel really fast and really quickly by rolling and multiplying up a tendon sheath. 
So identifying that you are at that level in certain instances is very important. Again, in this picture, you can actually see that we've got adipose tissue. So we know that not only are we through the epidermis, we're through the dermis, we're also in the hypodermis um, and then beyond because there's tendons also. But the most unhealthiest tissue type that you can find in wounds is, of course, your gangrenous or your necrotic tissue. And this is uh, forms as a result of non-vascularized uh, tissue and infection. It can be moist or it can be dry, depending on the presence of anaerobic or gas-producing bacteria. And it may or may not be malodorous, but in a lot of instances, it is associated with anaerobic bacteria and therefore um, is associated with a pungent smell, but not always. Um, so the braidment of the gangrene or the necrosis requires to be removed before a wound can, of course, heal. Um, and in some instances, to save a person's life, particularly where gas gangrene is involved. However, care should be taken when assessing the appropriateness of the braiding with a wound by first considering a patient's overall status. So what are contributing factors to the development of these negative tissue types? Well, poor vascular status can, so as I've said with gangrene, non-vascularized tissue will go mummified and gangrenous um, or necrotic. So therefore, vascular status is a major indicator to the development of um, the risk to the development of negative tissue types. Of course, infection and other diseases or comorbidities, trauma, pressure can contribute that, particularly in cases of pressure ulceration. Poor dressing choice, poor nutritional status can all contribute to the presence of these negative tissue types. So when it comes to not only identifying negative tissue types, we also have to be cognizant that we are not just assessing the wound singularly, but we are taking a step back and looking at the patient as a whole. Okay? And one of the ways that we can try and assess uh, risk to that limb in terms of um, risk to amputation or risk even to that patient's life is that we can also use uh, threatened limb classification systems such as the Wi-Fi system, or in Scotland, we also use um, the Texas ulcer classification system. And that's not only having focus on the wound itself, its depth or whether it has um, presence of negative tissues, but it's also being cognizant of what is contributing to that negative tissue forming and why is that wound deteriorating? Um, or not getting any better. And that's when we then have to start thinking about is there presence of ischemia or is there presence of foot infection? Because this tragic tr trilogy of ulcer presence, ischemia and infection will be major contributors not only in the production of negative tissue type, but be able to determine how quickly that patient can lose a limb or indeed lose their life. So other than Wi-Fi, there are other standardized holistic and multidisciplinary considerations and critical thinking frameworks that we can also consider. And one of them is by Schultz et al. in 2003, which I like, but it's had the, the Debbie um, the editorial on it. And as a podiatrist, I've also, because I do like this critical thinking framework, but it's missed out the mechanical control. So this is my adaption of Schultz's version where I've added on mechanical control. So when we are assessing these wounds, we are observing these tissue types, we have to think why. What's happening with that patient themselves? What's their psychological issues, their social circumstance, or what environmental, fact, uh, environmental factors could take place in contributing to that wound? or the deterioration of that wound. Um, what other comorbidity factors do they have, such as diabetes, peripheral um, vascular disease, malignancies, um, all of these types of things, as well as, is there um, pressure that is not being managed, such as um, heel pressure, mechanical or um, uh, functional um, abnormalities in the lower limb and foot that are contributing to these higher pressures? And then if we look at the actual wound itself, Schultz has recommended the TIME acronym, which very quickly as healthcare professionals allows us to look at a wound and think TIME. T for what tissue types are, are present and what do they mean? 
Is there a presence of infection or inflammation? Is the wound wet or dry? Or are the edges getting bigger or smaller? Or is the wound getting shallower or deeper? All of this together, hopefully, should allow us to have and make a holistic assessment for our patients. So evidence for wound debridement, well, wound debridement and the removal of that contaminated tissue and sustained cells is necessary for optimal wound healing. Evidence um, and research is showing us that. However, there actually isn't definitive evidence out there to suggest one method of debridement over another. And this largely rests on each and the clinician's experience or the patient's unique set of circumstance. So any decision on a wound debridement should be part of that holistic um, patient assessment and considering that patient's specific health and social circumstance, um, it's, it's absolutely fundamental. So it's important to achieve the right balance. And I nicked this slide from Duncan. Duncan's used this slide before, so thank you for this again, Duncan. Um, and what I'm referring to here, it's important to achieve the balance when um, considering um, about debridement. Now, the examples that we've got here is the balance between the toothpicks. So if you put somebody with ischemia, that you have to be very, very mindful that you are not, when you make that decision to use sharp debridement, that you are not going to cause trauma to that person um, as a result of your debridement. Or the opposite is actually when they've got neuropathy and a, va a well vascularized and perfused wound, could you actually in fact debride much more aggressively right down to bleeding uh, where evidence can suggest that that can actually help the healing process, okay? Um, but by removing viable tissue, it may prolong the healing process while removing too little sometimes can actually contribute to delayed healing were it to allow infection to form or for um, a wound that was potentially to bone not be identified and therefore be treated too late. So complete debridement um, of a chronic wound is rarely obtained in a single episode as well. So we have to consider if we do start debridement on a wound, is it just going to be one episode? Or is this a wound, for instance, for podiatry wounds where patients are walking on their feet all the time and those, those tissues will keep recurring? Are we in a situation where we have the right skills and the right uh, uh, treatment planning so that there can be continued debridement for that particular individual where it to be required? So the decision to debride the wound can be complex and may require multidisciplinary team involvement. But once the decision of debridement is made and the method confirmed, clinicians should then consider their own skills to perform that task, um, which was obviously alluded to in Duncan's presentation. So further staff training or specialist referral may be necessary in some um, cases. Um, and the fact that you are aware that other debridement um, uh, procedures are out there and it's out with your skill will make sure that you get the right treatment for your patient. So clinicians performing wound debridement are expected to have then good knowledge of the relevant anatomy and understanding of the range um, of wound debridement um, of the methods available, capability to identify viable tissues and differentiate non-viable tissues, the ability to manage pain and patient discomfort prior to, during, or following the procedure. So if you're going to do sharp debridement, you need to make sure that that patient has got appropriate pain relief um, ready where it to be required. Or um, if there was to be a complication such as bleeding, that you are prepared for that where it to happen. Okay? But some methods of Sorry, some methods of debridement require a lower skill level to perform and are available to generalists, nurses, podiatrists, and, and practitioners. And these include autolytic methods, biosurgical uh, therapy, which I'll go into in more detail, and uh, recently introduced mechanical debridement, such as debridement pads. So here we have a list of the different debridement methods. So there's autolytic debridement, mechanical debridement, sharp debridement, hydrosurgical debridement, surgical debridement, and biological debridement. 
So lots of different options for us as healthcare professionals. And you can understand why it's important that uh, uh, work is undertaken in terms of competency, ability, um, to know what these procedures are and are they within you or your team remit? And if they are not, how you then get that, that individual's wound to the right um, treatment method. And here's a lovely paper which I like and refer to a lot. And it's by Vowden and Vowden in 2011. And they have made this really nice table describing the different progressive types. They talk about mechanisms of actions, advantages, disadvantages, and of course, who and where are the right people um, to be doing it. But I'll go over it very briefly. Um, so autolytic debridement. So autolytic debridement we know happens naturally in all acute wounds. It's our own body self debridement um, by releasing phagocytic cells and endogenous enzymes, such as proteolytic enzymes and matrix metallocontinases or MMPs. And they act naturally to liquefy and separate necrotic tissue and slum. So our body is amazing. It can debride itself. Um, and we can also pick and choose certain different dressings, such as hydrogel dressings, to try and promote that, that self debriding process within an individual. However, this process can be slow. Um, autolytic debridement takes the longest work, usually weeks, sometimes even months. And it relies on the patient's own cells and enzymes to remove and liquefy that necrotic slough. The problem is for the majority of patients with chronic wounds, we know that the normal healing process is disordered. So this autolytic process tends to be delayed, disordered, um, and, and doesn't work even um, with the right environment. So this can be a very, very slow process. Mechanical debridement, such as the use of uh, wet to dry gauze dressings or debridement pads, um, are also debridement options for the non specialist. Um, so, wet to dry gauze, mainly used in America, not used in the UK that I am aware of, where you would put gauze on a wound, soak it with saline, and allow it to dry out, and then you rip the dressing off. You can understand is a very traumatic, painful, and in my opinion, quite harmful process. So we certainly don't use it in Scotland that I am aware of, um, but it, there is support of it in the literature. So it is important to know that I think it does exist and people, it is a method that can be used. And there's new debridement pads where um, you actually use a sterile pad, you run it under water, and you literally just rub, scrub, almost like a, a scourer that you would clean your pots and pans with over the surface of the wound. And again, this is aimed at the non-specialist um, uh, who could perform that level of debridement. Then we have podiatric sharp debridement or not podiatric if you are a nurse out there who has done a debridement course. So but, uh, this is just referring to sharp debridement. So this is obviously a very, very quick um, uh, method of debridement. It's cost effective. Um, it can be performed instantly where there's callus, fibrous, sloughy or necrotic tissue. Tendon or bone is selectively dissected from viable tissue using a scalpel puree or sterile scissors. It's performed out with the theatre environment, either in a clinic or in a patient's home. It may involve trimming of superficial non-viable tissue without causing bleeding, or it can be used where appropriate, where there's good vascularity, actually down to the level of the, the healthy tissue where you can get minor bleeding, but that must be assessed where there is um, vascular compromise, you, you would go less than, than more. Um, so this should only be performed by the advanced or the experienced practitioner if you were to be removing down to structures or going down to that um, bed. Okay. So it's really important when using a scalpel that you therefore have knowledge of the underlying anatomy and that you have proficiency with surgical instruments. It's essential. It's also important to know when to refer a patient to a surgeon. So when, when is it the stop for that podiatric sharp debridement? And when do you need to go on to surgical debridement? And knowing what you're excising and when to stop is critical. So know your anatomy, know what structures you're at, know where you are doing the debridement. Um, but please always explain to your patient what you plan to do first and the reasons why. 
and confirm that they understand the risks and the benefits to what you do before you do it, as well as any alternative options um, to the procedure so that they can consent to that in an informed manner. So here we have a quick um, case example. This is a case example of podiatric sharp debridement. This is Mrs M. She's 42 years old. She has past medical history of type 2 diabetes and depression. She's got peripheral neuropathy. She's also got peripheral arterial disease. Three years ago, she'd had a femoral popliteal angioplasty on the right limb. And here she is presenting having had a fempop angioplasty to the left limb. This has allowed her um, wounds to, sorry, the infection to be treated and for the toes to dry and mummify and demark as a result of that enhanced revascularization. Now, normally after revascularization, patients would then be taken in for surgical amputation of the toes, but this lady had really severe uh, depression and she just wanted out of hospital. She didn't want to stay in for another procedure and wanted home, so she was very anxious, very depressed, and the decision was that she got home and went into the care of us uh, uh, and our podiatry team. So using podiatric sharp debridement in the clinic, um, I was able to, having done a full holistic assessment and discussions with the surgical team, um, to go forward and amputate the digits using um, scalpel and nippers. So I was able to quite, very quickly remove those toes, and by removing those toes, remove bacterial burden. Once I'd got to that point, I was then able to reassess and was thinking, could I continue with surgical sharp debridement or even biosurgical debridement? And I decided that uh, with sharp debridement, I wasn't getting the results I wanted on the plantar ulceration because it had abscessed and ulcerated right down the, flex, uh, the flexor tendons and into the fascia. Um, so I knew that there was tendon and fascia and that larvae, the enzymes from larvae would not be able to um, remove that dead tendon. It can't liquefy anatomical structures. It can only liquefy slough and necrosis and gangrene. Um, so I knew that this wound was not appropriate for larvae um, and therefore it required further um, surgical debridement. But this type hydrosurgical debridement, so I used the VersaJet, okay? So the VersaJet allows me to use a bag of saline, which is pumped through the unit through a tiny hand piece, and I'm able to remove the, the um, remaining bone, the remaining um, uh, deteriorated tendon and um, damaged fascia away within my clinic um, without the patient having to be readmitted into the hospital. And I get a really nice result with that. So that was the plantar view there. This is the dorsal uh, view. So you can see I've taken off the toes. And then the next appointment, I've not been, I was able to remove the remaining bits of bone and clear away all of the loose tendon and fascia that was remaining. So a good result. So the VersaJet is this fluid jet technology. You're basically using a thin jet of water to uh, surgically debride. Um, these structures. It's licensed for use both in and out of theatre and it uses that high pressure saline jet and it offers a balance between um, debridement of non viable tissue and tissue preservation. Surgical debridement, that is where um, it occurs in the theatre environment. So that's where you're going to get your vascular, your orthopaedic, and your general surgeons to do your debridement. That involves debridement into the vascular layer past that dead tissue. So this is expert stuff. This is your top level debridement and it's performed when time is of an essence. And here's two examples of patients who came in who had spreading sepsis. Um, so they were systemically unwell and we urgently needed to remove the necrotic dead tissue that was um, occurring in the foot but was being a source of infection making that patient very unwell. So we then move on to biological debridement. So biological are lovely wee maggots. This involves the use of maggots to remove non-viable tissue. And these maggots are um, biological products which are able to selectively digest soft necrotic tissue, cellular debris, and serous drainage from pathogenic bacteria. Um, they do this by secreting very powerful proteolytic enzymes and antibacterial substances, which help to break down and liquefy dead tissue and bacteria. 
and they paid um, head down and tail up and breathe through their tail. So albeit they're contained in this bag, they secrete these enzymes, which then go onto the wound, liquefy the wound, and they can then suck that horrible liquefied um, material through the mesh bag in and then process it and out comes this sterile um, bacteria gone um, secretion. So here we have, we call it the fly hotel. So this is where the, the, the flies are and the larvae are produced. Um, so it's medicinal quality larvae. So they are produced within a lab environment and they are the common green bottle fly. They lay eggs, which can be disinfected and they've been used as the bridement methods for, for decades. Um, I've actually had experience using larvae for 20 years plus, um, but they have been become more accessible in the United Kingdom uh, since 2004, since they've been available on NHS prescription. They are scientific and clinical evidence to support the efficacy of this debridement technique, um, where they are also being found um, to reduce bacterial burden and, of course, therefore accelerate the healing process. So they arrive enclosed in this wee bio bag and can be used on many different types of ulcers, diabetic, pressure, burns, etc. the list goes on. But failures can occur and they usually occur due to the yuck factor from patients. So the idea of a treatment sometimes can be enough for patients to get a bit squeamish. However, what I've found is patients that have wounds that require these um, treatments generally are very open because they are just so compounded by the, the burden of these wounds that they will really be open to the suggestion of larvae and when you can explain to them the, the, the pros and cons, um, but in particular the pros, the benefits to this as a treatment, you generally get very good compliance. So really when compared with conventional methods of wound debridement, larvae really does offer effective and quick approach to wound debridement. And they are very cost effective against surgical debridement where you require uh, surgeons, theatres, anaesthetists, all of these different costs. Larvae um, really is a very, very cost effective treatment. Although initially you may think a couple of hundred pounds for a wee bag, but when you think of the thousands of pounds it costs for the surgical debridement, there's no comparison. And our patients can have this in the community while they're at home, they don't have to be admitted. So here's a, a biological debridement case example. This is Mrs. B, who's 36 years old. She was referred to Podiatry by the vascular surgical team. So she had urgent uh, surgical procedure done to open up an abscess and release drainage on the dorsum of her foot. Initial surgical procedure was poor, uh, performed and um, uh, she, as a result of that infection, uh, had went into a ketosis um, coma and she had full sepsis and was put into acute renal failure as a result of this wound. So she was desperately unwell and fighting for her life. So that procedure initially was to drain the pus out um, and, and try and stop her from passing away with the, this, this horrible infection. So implementing wound bed preparation in time and, and considering her holistically, we put a bag of larvae on and we, within three days of application, were able to dramatically um, debride the wound, uh, the slough from this uh, wound. And I, I didn't want to do any surgical or sharp debridement. And the reason why is because I knew those tendons were under there. 36 year old lady, I did not want to damage those extensor tendons. We want to make sure that she comes out of this, not only with a healed wound, but is able to have a functioning foot and can be well and walk. So we get a great result with this. And you can see here that we were able to fortunately heal this lady's wound. But again, please be cognizant as much as we heal these wounds in terms of podiatry and ongoing management of these patients, structurally you can see we have got challenges with this lady's healed foot. Um, so basically the larvae, it can be applied by a generalist or a specialist practitioner with excellent results, with um, really, really um, high level results in terms of outcomes and getting to healing. It can be applied both in the community and in the acute setting with basic training. 
um, and the closed bag method reduces the skill level required to be left in for four to five days. I'd just like to play you this very quick little video of an example of me actually applying um, larvae to a patient. Uh, so I'll just play this wee video for you. So just at the end there, I said produce a distinctive odour which can. Some patients will feel that the odour is infection and it's not infection. So it's important when you apply this bag to say to the, the patient that there will be an increased exudate or a leakage from the wound. That is normal. That means that the larva is working um, and not to be afraid of that. And that's one of the reasons why we like to change the top pad daily, just to make sure that um, we are monitoring the wound and how the larvae are working, but also just to make sure that you're not getting a buildup of addressing these smelly um, secretions in it that are not that are what we are expecting. So hopefully after you've applied that, you are then able to get a really again such an effective um, debridement outcome as a result of that therapy. Um, so I would just like to conclude and I'll run over a wee bit, so apologies. Um, I would just like to say that debridement aims to create conditions that enable wounds to heal. There are many different types of debridement methods, and I, I hope I gave you a whistle uh, stop tour of quite a, quite a few of them, which can be used to debride. However, evidence supporting one over another is lacking. So you can actually see, hopefully, in the examples I've given you, that they all have a place, but knowing where to bring in the different techniques of debridement requires the, the competency levels that Duncan had compared to. Podiatrists, obviously, I'm being a bit biased here, we play a, a pivotal role in the long-term management of chronic wounds, but so does anyone who's involved in the long-term management of chronic wounds. Um, and we are highly skilled practitioners for the assessment and management um, of wounds requiring not only a singular episode, but when it's referred to the ongoing maintenance debridements and recognising how that is required. A chronic wound can affect all aspects of a person's life, health and well-being, and it is important to address the contributing factors and support them in their return to health. Treatment options should always be discussed with the patient um, before anything is done, uh, discussing pros and cons so that it meets the needs and the aspirations of the patient um, with the actual wound. And practitioners undertaking sharp, surgical, or hydrosurgical debridement must have the knowledge to complete the task safely and effectively and can be confident in their ability to deal with any complications which may arise. If it's out with your expertise, seek advice. But biological debridement offers fast, effective and accessible debridement, which is evidence-based uh, for the generalist as well as for the specialist. Maggot therapy has been available in the NHS within the UK uh, on prescription since 2004 and are clinically effective for the debridement of sloppy and necrotic chronic wounds. But be mindful where there is presence of fibrous scar tissue, tendon, um, or bone, it will not be able to relieve that. 
that in order to bring the procedures to be the required. Maggots are applied in bagged form, so they're really easy to apply, um, and they're usually left uh, on a wind between three to five days. And secondary benefits of maggots can include the reduction of the bacterial burden and an acceleration of healing. So I hope we managed to consider all of the, the learning objectives that I had started with. And I just want to say thank you very much for listening and I hope you enjoyed that presentation. Fantastic. Thank you ever so much, Debbie. That was a brilliant presentation. And I hope everybody enjoyed at home. I can see the chat box is absolutely bursting. So uh, well done. Um, but what we're going to do now, everybody, we are going to be moving on to your questions that you've asked um, Duncan and Debbie. And at this stage of the webinar, I am also going to be inviting my colleague Vicky to join us. Um, and Vicky is the clinical support manager here at Biomond. Um, so let's have a little look at your questions and see what we've got for you all. Okay, so the first question is for you, Duncan. Um, Angela's asking, how can the levels in the capability framework match up against NHS banding skill set, please? Well, yeah, and you'll notice that I did allude to that during my presentation <clears throat> because they were initially in numbers and we change them to letters. Um, you, the, the levels in the capability framework do not um, reflect KSF uh, levels um, of um, special. What they do is they define where you are. If you attain certain levels in the capability framework, they don't automatically uh, mean that you can move up a level move up a grade. If you're applying for a different grade <clears throat> of job, it will define what, what your skill level is there and for you going for a, for a further job, but it will not, they do not automatically um, mean that you have to move up a level when that you would need to, uh, that would need to be going through a process. So don't think if you've moved up a level, oh, that's me now, a band seven for, for this, because I'm working at that level. Um, it would probably define your skills and allow you to possibly apply for a band seven post or to have a word with your manager, but it doesn't uh, automatically mean that you automatically move up a level. Perfect. OK, thank you for answering that, Duncan. Um, and another question for you as well um, is, is the document aimed for self-assessment only or can it be used via a peer review situation? Please? It can be used peer review, self-assessment, and it can be used to um, for service development for service providers to, to benchmark all, all the staff to make sure that they are covering all aspects that need to be done. So it can be used at these three different levels. It can be used for um, self-assessment, for peer review and service definition and the, to making sure that you have the capabilities within your service to treat um, all, um, the, all the treatments that that individual that you are treating will require. They don't all need to be by the same person, but as long as you have that skill set within your team, um, quite a lot of clinicians are working at higher levels in certain aspects of the document and maybe not at higher levels at certain other aspects. But generally within a multidisciplinary team, there's somebody working at the top level in each of the capability statements. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, and another question for you, Duncan, from Katrina. Uh, so there was a section on the framework, a uh, 9.3 um, qualified clinician, um, and she's asking what qualification does it refer to and is it degree level? Um, now, hold on, let me check on this one. Now, well, we go from <clears throat> qualified clinician is probably just as we come out of college, Debbie, isn't it? So we're really a band, a band five or are the new students coming out as a band five these days? Five, yeah. So they're coming out as a band five, so that is a qualified clinician. But then as you move up the framework um, and your knowledge and skill and your career progression 
um, that you will probably move to a seven, an eight, or we now have some consultant podiatrists. So the other levels would be the sixes, the sevens, the eights, and consultant podiatrists. But don't just assume because you're working at the top level in all of them that you automatically should be awarded a consultant podiatry post. That's not the case, I'm afraid. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Um, a question, um, I believe this might be one for both of you actually, so feel free to, to answer this one however you like. Uh, from Nicola, um, an issue is that staff struggle to get access to pressure relief resources. Mm -hmm. um, is there an easier way than going through uh, podiatry teams, um, CHLN or GP surgeries? Um, they've said that some give resources out and some don't. I reckon that there's some, uh, like for instance, trauma shoes that are actually available on prescription. Um, so, you know, it depends where you, your circumstance as a, a take a podiatrist or a healthcare clinician, but there, there are some um, things that you can get prescribed, but certainly Duncan would be able to answer in terms of pressure relief nationally. Um, <clears throat> You know, I also, that's a very good point, Debbie, that some are available on prescription. I know the, the Heal Pro um, is available, which is made by Taylor Made. they're available on prescription to protect uh, an individual's heels. Um, so um, we, we have uh, in Scotland, um, we have the CPR for Feet campaign, and we standardise the pressure, uh, the heel pressure for individuals within our care, within um, all care settings, and they're available through the National Distribution Centre, but they're not on prescription. But I do know that uh, the Heal Pro one is on prescription, okay. um, and that's a single patient use item. Getting pressure relief or redistribution, um, if you're wanting to ambulate individuals, it is generally done through the, um, the multidisciplinary team. And it's quite difficult for some community settings to get these. Mm -hmm. And because I don't think the community loan stores that nurses have access to, for instance, provide a lot of these. But we always encourage anyone with an active ulceration, if they can possibly attend, at least for assessment, to the multidisciplinary team so that we can take into consideration all different aspects of the care. And in most hospitals, I certainly with all the years I've worked with Debbie, we always had a stock within the hospital that we could give um, the individual the pressure redistribution or relief that they needed right at that point of care. Wonderful. Thank you for clarifying that both. And thank you for providing so much helpful information there. Um, now, another question just on the, comp um, the framework for you, Duncan. Um, so Amy's asking, could the document be expanded to enable evidence and of skills and reflective practice? Hey, yes, does she want to carry out that task? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 that is a, that is a very, very good question. This document, as you see, has progressed and the, um, the pressure redistribution aspect of this and the vascular section of this have been recently added sections to this. So this is a constantly evolving document and I will take that very sensible suggestion on board. Brilliant, thank you. Um, now a question uh, for both of you again, I believe, and this is from Robert. Um, so he's asking uh, when posts are available within the NHS or elsewhere, um, when are they going to affect uh, capabilities, especially for those who are working at advanced um, or at consultancy posts? Um, and other than self-assessment, what are the means are available to assess competencies? So I, I, I certainly think that, uh, again, we're referring to particularly the world of diabetes, where that, that multidisciplinary setup, which already exists, is a, a, an amazing environment, not only for the people who are in that team. So working with vascular surgeons, orthopedic surgeons, podiatrists, specialist nurses, vascular nurses. So there is an environment where we are able to discuss cases share skills um, and, and do reflection in terms of our own skills and learning from others. 
So that's, that's a fantastic environment. So what we try to do in our area is we are opening that up to our community colleagues and we're trying to encourage, well, we are actually currently facilitating um, the community staff to be able to come into this environment and be part of that. So to see the skills that are there, not only from a podiatric point of view, but from an interprofessional uh, perspective as well. So what are the surgeons doing? Do you need the opportunity to actually go in and go into the theatres and see what they do? Um, what does the vascular nurse do? What are their debridement skills? How do they operate? So that's certainly how we try to um, align that. Um, so where you're at that specialist role, you've got that interprofessional environment, and where you're in that community, we bring you in there to have that peer support um, to help facilitate that. But there are discrepancies in areas as to the availability of the consultant podiatrist post. In Scotland, we have, what well, I think, one consultant podiatry post, and it's an MSK. You know, um, whereas in England, they are much, much um, more um, forward thinking in terms of um, taking forward and recognising the skills of that advanced podiatrist going beyond and into the, pod the podiatric surgeon, of course. Um, so really, I think you can be restricted by your area and, and the actual posts that are there. But where you do have those, it's about interacting and sharing those skills and using that as a means of reflecting um, and then um, taking that to that next level. Yeah, I totally agree, Debbie. I know um, from personal experience recently that um, managers who are interviewing are increasingly for diabetes posts are increasingly using the document. And when somebody comes in for interview and will maybe have the document and say, do you have evidence of your capability at these levels? And you um, and are expecting people to A, know about the document and B, to have evidence of um, their level of capability and that to make sure that they have um, the skill set that is required to carry out that role. So it's very, very good in an interview and career progression and sense as well. Brilliant. Thank you both. Um, now, a question for you, Debbie, just regarding one of your case studies that you mm -hmm. presented. Uh, Vicky's asking, how long did the case uh, with the foot um, in the boiling water take to get yeah. epithelialized tissue? Yes. So that probably took, uh, uh, it was a journey of about three and a half, four months. Mm -hmm. Um, which actually was quite quick um, in terms of some of the chronic ulceration that we can get in diabetes. So again, there was a multitude of different debridement um, methods that were used for that um, particular chart. So I did sharp debridement, podiatric sharp debridement in clinic for removal of the second toe. You might have noticed that that toe was gone by the time it had healed. So we did quick debridement to get rid of that toe, um, having assessed his vascularity and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and then we actually used larvae. Um, with, there was a, a particularly uh, large patch on the dorsum of the foot that started to become a bit um, uh, deeper, we suspected. So we did a quick um, treatment of larvae to very quickly remove that. So we got them to granulation really uh, quite quickly. So I would say from start to finish, it was about three and a half, four months. And he is still with us. And at the point, he was a person who was on um, a dialysis. Um, so he was a really challenging patient as well um, in terms of how his general health was. So to get a result of four months with such a drastic um, a wound was a great success. And I can happily say not only has he had a kidney transplant, um, but he is also still ulcer free. So um, a really, really good result with that case. Yep. Oh, amazing. Such wonderful work that you all do. Um, and another question for you, Debbie. Um, so have you got any tips on thorough wound debridement when the gift of pain remains uncompromised? Mm -hmm. So, oh yeah, so that is always going to be difficult. So where um, the, the person has pain can, can change your clinical decision-making very quickly. Um, and that is where your larvae debridement is really good. Uh, we tend to find that patients that have sensation do very well with larvae because they don't have that um, uh, the physical part to it. 
Um, so we use larvae a lot where there is an intact um, sensitivity to our patients. But obviously, we will make sure that before any procedures are done, that the patient is on the right pain medication um, and they are on it consistently. They're not waiting for pain. They are on a managed, um, prescribed uh, uh, pain um, treatment regime so that uh, we can try and anticipate pain before it actually happens. So we still do sharp debridement, but we have to either anaesthetise um, or uh, use effective pain management or we favour um, larvae therapy as a result of that. Brilliant. Thank you very much for answering that one, Debbie. Um, now, another question for you from Liz. Um, looking at different types of bacteria, um, is there any sort of resource that tells um, clinicians what types of smell goes with what type of bacteria? Yeah, that's a very, very, yeah, <laughs> very good question, actually. Um, so I, I suppose the one that's the most um, recognised is your anaerobic bacteria, isn't it? You know, so it's that metallic, really horrible metallic um, uh, smell that you can get. One that can even extend from the patient's dressing into a waiting area, uh, where you're very aware as the patient is walking in that there is an anaerobic infection present. So it's the back of the nose, and it's very metallic. Now, the smells that really are probably once a year, it's pretty much once, if it's a bad year, I'll, I'll smell it twice in the year, and that is your gas gangrene. So as soon as I smell gas gangrene, the hairs in the back of my neck are up because if I smell that smell, my patient is at risk of death. So when I recognise it, my, my, you know, my hackles are up. It's a particularly bad smell. It is a mix of that anaerobic smell, but it's also, how can I describe this? There's an eggy, sulfurous smell to it, um, and it's very distinct, um, and usually it's gas-producing, so it will. its job is to travel um, and travel into the tissues very rapidly and into the bloodstream, and your patient is at risk of death if you smell that. So um, when it comes to your um, gas gangrenes and your anaerobes, there's, you know, there's, you will notice it, it's, it's there straight away. In terms of your um, gram negatives, such as your pseudomonas um, type smells, they tend to be visually very apparent to see because a pseudomonas, particularly in chronic wounds where it forms very easily, um, you will see a bright green staining and it comes with a low grade kind of musty smell. So again, if you get that low grade musty smell where a wound is really macerated, uh, then it's quite easily recognised by the staining as well. Um, but your staphylococcal um, uh, gram positive bacteria tend not to have the same type of odour than your anaerobics, which are so easily um, and readily recognised. But yeah... yeah. They actually should do a piece of work and, and, <laughs> and you know, um, put that down. However, your perception of smell is subjective as well. So some are more sensitive than others. So with that... But it's not true, Debbie. Once you've smelled gas gangrene, you oh. never forget it. You'll never forget it, but it's for good reason because your yep, absolutely is an urgent, urgent um, yep. danger, you know. Oh, fab. Thank you both for taking the time to answer that one. Very interesting. Um, so another question we've got for you is, um, is there a way of uh, determining how much to debride or will this come with experience? Yeah, I would say that, that that comes with experience, but mainly it's go back to that holistic assessment of your patient. It's so important to have done that, particularly when determining um, vascularity, presence of infection, structures that are involved so all of these different factors are what then allows you as a clinician to come to that decision as to what is right and uh, when to stop. so there isn't one main thing there are times where you want to go down to the structure you want to go even just beyond the healthy tissue but that can only be done when you've done a holistic assessment and that you know that you are less likely to be doing harm to that patient than if you were to leave it. So unfortunately, I'm going to be quite vague and not answer that directly because it's part of a much bigger picture. And that's why it was important. I put that 
holistic considerations and interprofessional considerations of the patient. Fab, thank you. And we've got a huge amount of questions coming through. So thank you to everybody watching at home as well. I really hope you're enjoying and thank you for um, to Duncan and Debbie for continuing to answer all of your questions. So the next question we've got is from Michael um, and he's asking what clinical assessments or investigations would you consider before sharp debriding a necrotic wound on an ischemic, ischemic sorry, I, I, apologies if I pronounce that incorrectly, um, on an ischemic patient, assuming the patient is neuropathic and pain is not an issue? So, could you just say the, the start of that question again? Of course I can, yes. Uh, so what clinical assessments or investigations okay. would you consider so, before sharp debriding? Clinical assessments obviously it would be what, what would be the benefits to the patient. So they've got a, this scenario was that the patient had ischemia. So I suppose what you're wanting to do is determine is it an ischemic limb that has been revascularized? Do you know what I mean? Um, how far you then want to take it down? Because if you have got a dry, demarked, necrotic area, that because that person is just, they don't have that good autolytic debridement to finally just naturally, you know, reject that demarked necrosis, then in that instance, that could be one where you would go, yes, they have ischemia, um, but in this instance, I still think it is appropriate that we still try to remove that bit that's just not quite coming off and just needs, you know, so I'm good doing this, <laughs> but just just needs to come off and you are not actually going in to then create a new wound on tissues that potentially might not be able to heal. Yeah. So in that instance, I don't know if you agree with that, Duncan, that might be a scenario. Absolutely. I totally agree with you, Debbie. Um, but, and also sometimes if you think a vascular intervention that will improve the situation can be carried out, you might delay the debridement till that has been carried out, and then that will allow you to um, carry on with that debridement uh, and, and putting the, the individual at less risk. So sometimes there's maybe a delay till the vascularity is improved, and then you can progress. But we never just look at one form of debridement. Many wounds need very different uh, forms of debridement at different stages, and you yeah. can chop and change. You don't just need to use one and stick with that. And as Debbie so beautifully says, it's all about that assessment, and it's all about having the confidence and the skill and of doing that assessment and knowing what is the right thing at that right time. And understanding the pros and cons in that particular yeah. situation is the risk of leaving that going to put the limb more at harm than where you to take it away is another uh, one. So where there is active, uh, you know, it's established they have, for instance, ischemia that can't be revascularized but have this negative tissue type, one of the ways in which where there is indecision or just unsure, you do it in a supported way. You, you seek opinion from the extended team and in our extended team would be our vascular surgeons. We've established a very, very good and sound working relationship with them where I can say, can I discuss this patient with you? Is this one that you want and you want me to refer back to you? Or are you happy and feel as though covered X, Y, and Z of this patient that I can then go forward in a supported way with the patient as well and do this procedure because it felt that by leaving it, the patient would be worse off. We alluded to it very well earlier. That should all be discussed with the patient as well. And you should be seeing the, the cons as well as the pros to the patient. Mm -hmm. And, you know, engaging them um, within that and letting them know the risks or the benefits. And that is a very, very important thing to be building up that relationship between the clinician and the patient and involving them actively in their own care. And it's, it's also important to know when you just can't. So yep. that there is that area that you think, well, I could just, I could just get that off if I put a wee bag of something on there, or, or <laughs> I, I did a wee cut there, that would come away fine. But if the patient doesn't want it, or it's just we can't get around the discomfort, the pain, anxiety, any of these issues, then you just have to start, step yeah. back and say it's not appropriate. Absolutely. 
Wonderful. Thank you both again. And just continuing the discussion around larval therapy. So I'm going to invite Vicky on to answer this question um, from Arlene. Um, she's asking how long do the larvae need to stay in place once they're on a wound and do you need to add moisture and if so how often? Okay so um, first of all can I just say thank you for a wonderful webinar this has been brilliant I've just been watching this in absolute awe and the chat's been fantastic as well but yes going back to the question um, so uh, the larval therapy stays on for four days with the day of application being day zero um, and yes you do need to apply moisture every day so it's saline moistened gauze every single day whilst they're on the wound um, Obviously, just make sure you wring out any excess because we don't don't want to drown them. But but yeah, every single day. Was there a third part to that question or was that um, just asking how often uh, would how they often? need to add moisture? Yeah, so every single day. If you want to know a bit more detail about the love therapy, though, do come and watch some of our other webinars where I, I go into the, the more ins and outs of it. So if you want to learn. Can, Vicky, can I ask you a question? Of course. <clears throat> Quite often when you're applying larvae, it creates moisture and yes. creates exudate. So in those circumstances, do you feel you still need to be adding saline to that? It depends. Well, yes, but you, you need to bear in mind. So like if the so if you've got a patient who's got a very wet wound already, then obviously you need to be mindful of that. And that's why you always say uh, make sure you wring out as much of the excess saline as possible, um, because obviously you don't want to drown the larvae. Um, and if you have already got a very wet wound, then it's worth considering whether actually larvae are appropriate in that situation, because like you say, they're going to liquefy that tissue. So. You yeah. could in inadvertently drown them, um, which would be really sad. <laughs> so, yeah, something to bear in mind. Thank Fantastic. Oh, also, on, Debbie. <laughs> would you mind if I also add um, that don't, uh, when you're putting the larvae, uh, the saline on, then don't completely irrigate the, the wound away because you don't want to flush away all those amazing enzymes. Absolutely. That, that the maggots have just put on and, uh, and is doing the job of liquefying. So you don't want to wash all of that away either. So it's, yeah. just, you know, it's, it's, it's getting that balance, isn't it? Yeah, so we would always recommend putting a fresh bit of saline moistened gauze on every day as opposed to adding the saline in because yep. of that and also because you can't control how much saline you're putting in. So yeah, always put a fresh bit of saline moistened gauze on every single day. Perfect. Thank you, Vicky. Thank and you. just another question uh, while you're on the screen in relation to yes. the bio bags. Um, somebody's asking how long can bio bags be left on? Do you need to inspect daily? And do the larvae have a normal life cycle, such as turning into flies? And is it important, therefore, to change the bag by a certain time? So that's quite a lengthy question. Yeah, so so a bit, a bit similar to the last one. So yes, you do need to uh, inspect them every day. They're on for four days, with the day of application being day zero. So kind of five days, nine to six hours. Um, and um, yeah, so... It, Fly, different flies have different life cycles um, and um, it's a it's a bit of a long um, answer so I'm not going to go into it in great detail in this webinar but if you want to learn about them do come to one of our other webinars um, but long story short when you take them off on the on the day four um, there's a big buffer between them one they would have um, pupated and turned into flies to them becoming flies so it is it's it's not an urgent thing to get them off on day four you would have plenty of time before they became flies um, so hopefully that answers that question lovely that's great thank you very much Vicky yeah. um, now the next question goes back to you Debbie um, it's from Charlie and they're asking um, how often in uh, the cases you've shown would you need to um, anesthetize the treated area and are there any considerations that they'd need to take into account to decide whether to provide anesthesia prior to treatment? So for all of the patients that I um, use as case studies, including the nurse jet and including amputation of digits and all of that kind of stuff, none of them required um, any anesthetic at all because of the devastating effect that diabetes has on the neurological system. And all of these patients were profoundly neuropathic. So um, the lady who uh, sharp, uh, amputated her toes through podiatric sharp debridement sat and watched me do it with great pleasure, believe it or not, because she was so delighted to lose those gangrenous toes. She didn't want them uh, um, on her anymore. Um, and I, I didn't require any anaesthetic at all. So, and that was even cutting through um, 
phalanx through bone and, and she couldn't feel anything. So every case that I had, and same as the chap who had the burn injury in a, a, a shirt that amputated his toe, um, again, no, no anaesthetic required. So um, it's, it's rare for me to require anaesthesia. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's just the nature of our patients with um, these yeah. foot alterations. Oh, thank you for your honesty with that question. Um, and just to follow on uh, with the cases you've presented, so somebody else has asked um, regarding the patient that had the visible flexor tendons, yes. um, how was that wound closed in the end? Was it ne negative pressure therapy or VAC that you used? So, no, we, um, we didn't actually. That was, um, I've even forgotten the name of it. It was uh, Kerabit, you remember? It, I don't even know if Kerabit's about anymore. But we used Keraboot with her. Um, so basically, it's kind of like a plastic bag where you put the patient's limb in the plastic bag and it creates a warm, moist environment. It's almost like a kind of tropical um, environment within um, the, the, the boot itself. The reason why we used that is because we didn't want anything on top of those tendons. We didn't want anything touching those tendons at all because we wanted them to... Uh, we didn't want any dressings touching it. We certainly didn't want um, any, um, just anything to cause any harm to them. We wanted to try and keep them as functional as we could. So that's why specifically we chose the care of it and it, it worked really well with her. So it helped um, also not only with the moist, moist wound healing environment, but it helped after the larvae to keep the wound bed nice and clean and granulated. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and another question just regarding your cases, Debbie. So Jean is asking, is microsurgery alone sufficient to resolve a wound that's also infected? Uh, yes, it can be. Um, so as long as if you get really good antimicrobial management through oral therapy, um, again, which can be influenced uh, by patient's vascularity, then yes, through regular micro debridement, you, you um, can not only physically remove bacterial burden from the removal of the, the tissue itself, but obviously with effective um, oral therapy or where required intravenous therapy, then you have got the, the toolkit, as Duncan had put it, um, a really good toolkit to try and um, manage that, um, you know, in, in an effective way. Perfect, thank you. And a question for all three of you. So we've had a number of um, viewers asking similar questions actually regarding this. Um, are there any qualifications in uh, this particular field of wound management for diabetic feet? And also, um, are there any uh, learning sort of qualifications they can do for larval therapy as well? Oh, can I answer? <coughs> the of course you can, bit. yes. Right. Reading a paragraph from the document. In the UK, clinicians providing diabetic foot care from basic screening through to histolic management of diabetic foot complications have attained their professional skills in a range of ways. There are no standardized route by which theoretical and clinical skills needed to provide safe and efficient diabetic foot care can be obtained. Current workforces still require a structured approach to detailing professional capabilities in the delivery of diabetic foot care. Now, there are certain modules like that we, that we can do, but there isn't a structured pathway to gain all these skills and capabilities. And but So the document isn't st steering you towards where you can get these skills. It is telling you the skills that you require and how you obtain those can be through mentoring, can be through some courses, can be through all different avenues. Um, carry on. You can come at that from an educational side, Debbie. Perfect. I'd just like to say that at Glasgow Caledonian University, I'm module leader for an MSc level uh, module called the Lower Limb and Foot and Diabetes Evaluation at Risk. So if any of you are interested in doing an MSc level accredited um, a module in the Lower Limb and Foot and Diabetes, then it's available at our university. It can be done singularly, or you can do it as part of an MSc in Diabetes Care and Management for the full MSc programme. 
But just as Duncan is saying is that that doesn't then guarantee you that specialist post. However, in NHS Scotland, particularly where I work in NHS Lanarkshire, any diabetes posts generally are um, advertised looking for applicants who are studying at MSc level. Yep. So if that's where you wanted to go, then GCU um, <laughs> a, <laughs> a lovely module for you all if any of you were interested. And I presume there are similar <laughs> modules around different aspects of the country. What I was trying to allude to, there isn't one singular one, but obviously maybe in Scotland, that is the one where pe that is the go-to. But yeah. I know we've got people from Ireland, from England and Wales on this webinar. It's not a professional qualification, it's an academic qualification. Correct. It yeah. doesn't guarantee you that post, but um, certainly employers are looking at you to be um, studying at that level. Mainly. Wonderful. Thank you both for answering that one. And just to follow on, so with the discussion around universities, uh, Caroline is asking, um, can the framework be used in universities or does it have to be self-assessment only? Um, no, it can be used in the framework and as alluded to in the, uh, the framework, we, we would um, uh, put it as learning outcomes, you yep. know, so when you achieve uh, your accreditation for them, you are achieving specific learning outcomes, which generally are aligned to um, the, the outcomes of the competency framework. The only thing is in terms of uh, debridement and all of that, we don't have like a debridement qualification or anything, but certainly in the overall learning about the specialism pertained to the lower limb, we do um, follow those specific parts of um, the, the lower limb and foot and diabetes. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so Vicky, a few more questions for you now just regarding larval therapy. So <laughs> Mareem is asking, is larval therapy safe for all um, or are there any possible um, allergy uh, sort of reactions that clinicians would need to be aware of? Okay, so there are a few con um, contraindications. Um, with regards to allergies, um, if you've got a patient who's allergic to a green bottle fly um, or their larvae, um, or if they're allergic to um, polyvinyl alcohol foam or polystyrene, styrene rather, then those are three the three things that we need to um, just be, be checking for allergy wise. Um, like I said, there, there's not many contraindications, but um, things to be aware of are things like if you've got a patient who's high risk of bleeding. So if they're on warfarin, heparin and they're not within their um, therapeutic range um, or if they've got a major blood vessel involved and you suspect it to be necrotic, then you should be being cautious around those as well. Um, they're, they're the main ones probably to consider, certainly in this situation. Um, if you want to know more information though, we've got um, so many different ways that you can learn more about love therapy. Um, and we do webinars as well, where we go into the quantifications a bit more detail. So, um, yeah, but those are the ones to bear in mind probably in this situation. Perfect, thank you for that, Vicky. Um, and a few questions that may be for all of you. Um, somebody's asking, mm -hmm. do you feel Entonox has a place within a clinical setting for debridement and wound management? I don't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Debbie, no. No. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, again, it's not something I've even required to consider just because it, it, it's my specialism is, is diabetes mainly. I do, I'm involved in non-diabetic patients when I go into the vascular ward, and they generally are in an environment where there's surgeons, um, uh, you know, that they can um, get patients, and you know, anaesthetized. Um, so it's in a, in a kind of much more supported environment. So in terms of outpatient, you know, if I, does a patient get Entinox to help with a wound, I've just not been in that situation, unfortunately, where it's required so I'm sure there, there possibly might be but uh, not when I have any experience of. Um, certainly from my TVN days back in, in the hospital we did use Entonox occasionally it was usually for very very large wounds though to be fair and usually things like open abdomens um, groin areas things like that are very sensitive um, parts of the, of the of the body um, generally we didn't ever use them for for lower limb Fab, thank you all for answering that one. Um, someone has asked as well, so what is the best debridement technique for a patient who has compromised circulation? 
Hmm. Um, I suppose it depends on the extent of the debridement that's required, really, isn't it? Um, so I suppose if it was superficial um, and light, then and they've got vascular disease, then you would really be trying to um, promote um, autolytic debridement through the choice of wound dressings that could help to try and promote and facilitate that where the patient to have a delay in the natural process, which in vascular disease is, is likely. Um, if it was um, a much greater or deeper um, uh, level of negative tissue type, then, you know, if they had vascular disease, you would be looking to consider that in a multi-professional um, setting where you have support from the vascular team, because it could be if the patient is unable to be revascularized, then again, you know, you, the best option is, is not to do it. Um, so it, it really just depends um, on that, that, that individual's um, circumstance. I don't know if anyone has anything else to you add. Can't, you can't just say, oh, for a vascular person, this is the best form of debridement. It's depending on what type of tissue, what you're trying to achieve, how quickly you're trying to achieve it, and how quickly you can achieve it safely. Yeah. As Debbie's alluded to, and it all comes down to what Debbie said about that histolic approach and assessment is key. So you can't just say one suits vascular and one suits neuropathic. It's all down to tissue type and everything surrounding that histolic assessment. Great. OK, thank you. And just uh, really focusing on so the specific types of uh, debridements, uh, someone has asked, um, obviously, there's been a lot of um, uh, patients they've seen coming through um, who are non-diabetics, but they do have really painful ischemic ulcers. Um, and they're wondering that if those wounds are sloughy, um, what's the best form of debridement they can use that wouldn't be painful for those patients? Well, I suppose um, larvae, you know, larvae bags, as I, did, as I alluded to, it's a, a choice um, which I would use um, if that's the, the, the circumstance, you know, because it is such a, a quick method of debridement um, and I've, it's not always pain free because in the ischemic limb without neuropathy can be very painful just through uh, the very fact that you have critical limb ischemia, that in itself um, causes a painful limb, never mind a wound over and above that. Um, so in these types of patients, then larvae actually is a very good choice um, for these, or again, as mentioned previously, um, using particular dressings to promote or enhance autolytic processes. Um, so I would probably favour those two over any a form of sharp or hydrosurgical, yeah. or, um, and if, you're, if at that point you're looking into surgical, then you're looking for something much more radical than, than a localised debridement, unfortunately. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you for answering that, Debbie. Um, and Tashif is asking, um, when should autolytical debridement uh, be carried out? They've said automatical, but I, I think they mean autolytic debridement. So that's, that's obviously your body's natural process. So were you to see autolytics, it, it, it will naturally happen. And if the healing process is normal, so you go through that normal phase of um, wound healing from, you know, hemostasis to inflammation and um, through to proliferation, then that, that autolytic debridement process will happen naturally. And you will see that when you take the dressing off, where there to be any slough, that it is loose and, and can come away itself or a, a hardened cap will come away or even a toe, a mummified toe, will very quickly start to wobble at the base. And each time you take the dressing off, finally the, the toe or the digit or whatever will, will just come away itself. So where you see that process happening, then it's happening, you know. So you wouldn't want to um, try and interrupt that process because that is happening that naturally. If there is delay or disorder or there are signs of infection forming and you suspect that there may be a trapping of pus or, you know, any sinuses or anything like that, that's where you would then interrupt that process and try and do something more radical and more quick to try and uh, remove bacterial burden and establish what's going on underneath. 
Amazing, thank you. Um, and Robert has asked as well, um, so focusing on the, the patient that you mentioned that had uh, dialysis, um, yeah. Robert has asked, so there's a push for more services to provide care for dialysis patients. Um, and do you have any words of wisdom for debridement on patients that are currently undergoing dialysis? Yeah, so I'm very lucky where I, I work. So uh, within NHS Lanarkshire, I work in a hospital, the acute hospital site that's the, the vascular um, central area. But there's another acute hospital site in our area, which is Monkland Hospital, and it's our renal unit. So uh, whenever I have any patients that are um, in dialysis and they uh, have a, a foot wound, I'm able to inform my colleagues over at the dialysis unit. Um, and they are actually able to see the patients when they are over there. So again, the decision-making, this is a very, very vulnerable and risky patient group. So the decisions for how radical uh, a treatment or debridement method is used, it's the, that decision-making is done in an MDT environment, um, considering that individual patient's needs. And then when the patient then can come over to my site, which is where they are living, um, and therefore why they still see me, I can then be part of that. So our decisions for our patients with, uh, that, who are on dialysis is done in a multidisciplinary um, uh, uh, team uh, way. Perfect. Thank you very much for answering that one. And there's been a lot of compliments coming through in the questions just about the VersaJet uh, machine that you used uh, to, to bride a particular um, case, Debbie. Um, everybody said how impressive that was. Um, but uh, Fenella in particular has asked uh, what was used to offload the planter um, for the patient. Um, so was that the patient that, oh yes, of course, my, so it was the one with the planter and the digital amputation. That's so the one, yeah. It was an air cast boot I used for her. So the diabetic walker, which has a very exaggerated rocker sole to it. Um, and the reason why we chose that, normally for the a forefoot, we could go for a forefoot heel walker. But because she had ulceration going down into the plantar fascia, the heel walker would have actually um, had a, a kind of edge partially across where her ulceration was. So we used a, an air cast diabetic walker so that we immobilised our, our ankle, we were able to put her under compression for the lower leg and had a very good walker sole and we also put in a, a total contact insole with a cut out along where the, the actual um, ulceration site was. So uh, we had, we, that's, that's the method that we used and it worked really well. Oh, brilliant. Thank you for clarifying that. And Sean is asking as well, do you use slipper casts at all? Yes, uh -huh. yeah. we generally, yeah, we do. Uh, we use them. Um, it's We work uh, hand in hand. We don't do them as podiatrists, but no podiatrists out there do them. But again, we've got a really great MDT team. So we've, we work very closely with our orthotist colleagues. So it's our orthotist colleagues that jointly will review our patients and they'll do slipper casts, or we call them below knee total contact casts. So we'll do a plaster cast right to below the knee and then we'll bivalve it. So we'll cut the front shelf of the boot away so that we can then remove it and change the dressings however frequently they are required. So we use slipper casts, like shoe casts, but we also use below knee casts as well. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, and just to end then, so I can see the last couple of questions we've received um, would be for you, Vicky. So we're ending with uh, some larvae questions. Uh, Mike is asking, do larvae help break down biofilms? Yes, they do. Um, they love a good biofilm and very, very, very um, effective. Um, it's, we've got some really good research to show how they break down um, uh, Staphylococcus and MRSA uh, biofilms. Um, so, yeah, if you want to learn more about that, then do come along to one of our other webinars. But th they break them down in as quickly as 24 hours. Um, so, yeah, very effective. And they'll keep them gone as well. They, they won't let them grow back again whilst they're on the wound. Wonderful, thank you. And just going back to the question you answered earlier about the mm -hmm. moisture, uh, Wayne is asking, does the saline um, moistened gauze, um, does it go under the larvae or does it go on top of the bio bag? So it goes on top of the bag. So you put the bag directly on the wound, make sure it's got good contact with the wound bed, then your saline moistened gauze and then some simple padding and, and bandage or tape. 
Wonderful. Thank you very much. You. And as far as I can see, that's it for the questions. So thank you so much uh, for answering all of those. I know there were a lot of questions to get through, but you provided some absolutely amazing answers. And I hope everybody at home enjoyed listening to those questions as well. And thank you for um, inputting those questions to us all as well. So um, bear with me, apologies. Let's get the screen to work for you. So I hope you all enjoyed this evening. Um, but of course, uh, as Vicky's mentioned, we do host Biomond live webinars every week. Um, we host them every Thursday. And the next one we've got coming up is for prescription initiators. And that's going to be next Thursday for you all. So please do feel free to register. We'd love to see you there. Um, but of course, if you do have any questions uh, after tonight's webinar, um, we are always available for you to contact. You can call our clinical helpline that is man 24 7 um, we also have a website for you which um, we've recently relaunched we've got a brand new biomond website uh, with lots of new training resources um, available for you and also you can of course email us um, just feel free to email our clinical help desk and again we'll we'll get back to any queries that you may have and of course uh, we are also on social media as well um, so do have a look at those uh, feel free to follow us or pop us a like or a comment we'd absolutely love to hear from you but that is it from us this evening so I really really hope you've all enjoyed you've been an absolutely wonderful audience and I can't thank you all enough for joining and a huge thank you to Debbie uh, to Duncan uh, for presenting for you and also to Vicky as well for helping with the questions but that's it from us so thank you everybody for uh, attending Biomond Live and we will let you enjoy the rest of your evening thank you everybody